fitness myths. Every year there seems to be a new one, and now there's so many that I actually had to stop at 15 for today's episode. Maybe we'll do a follow-up episode with some of the other ones. But today we're going to be talking about 15 fitness myths that just don't seem to die. Like, I don't know why they still exist. I've been out of the game for two years and they're still here. And I have to say that number five is probably the one that I'm most guilty of actually thinking was true for the longest time. Hello and welcome to the Phoenix Mentality Podcast. I'm your host, Shane Hubbard. Today we're going to be talking about just that, 15 myths that just won't seem to die, and I can actually talk in great lengths about these because they're all things that I either used to believe or they're things that I have debunked for myself through research. So let's go ahead and start with number one. And by the way, none of these are in any particular order. I just uh, was doing some research and I was like, oh, that one sounds like it's pretty crazy. Let's do that. And so on and so forth. These are also common questions that I have gotten over the years from clients or just from people that follow me on social media. By the way, if you don't follow me on Instagram, which is where I'm the most active and where you can actually socialize, unlike YouTube, uh, if you follow me at Shane Hubbard Fit, uh, it's a good time. Definitely worth uh, the follow for sure. Okay, so let's go with number one, spot reducing body fat. This one, I, I mean, I think this has been around since I was in fitness 20 or so years ago. So you can't reduce body fat in a very specific area. So the thought was, okay, if I do a lot of crunches, I'll get rid of my ab fat or my stomach fat. If I do a lot of bicep curls, I'll get rid of my you know, my bicep fat. Um, female clients would come to me all the time. Can we do something to get rid of this, this fat underneath my arm? Can we do tricep extensions? Can we do, you know, work this muscle to lose fat in that area? And unfortunately, it just doesn't work that way. I remember reading a study that was showing that in a fasted state, if you did certain uh, cardiovascular exercise or if you did certain ab exercises, you could reduce body fat in that area. Um, the problem with that study was is there was no follow-up. So while fat was being mobilized in that area, fat was also being accumulated in that area when calories were in a surplus. So everything comes back to calories, and I know it's the most annoying annoying thing in the world, but it's true. You know, regardless of what you do with exercise and where you try to lose fat, your body is going to be trying to lose fat or is going to lose fat all over your body in, you know, certain periods. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't necessarily lose, uh, you know, fat first in your arms versus your stomach. I mean, your body likes to hold on to fat in certain areas just because, like, for women, keeping fat in your butt and your thighs is just part of your genetics and your hormones and things like that. So unfortunately, it's not something that's easy to lose in those areas. But nine times out of 10, when you lose body fat, and if you do it for a long enough period of time, and you get low enough body fat area, you're going to see fat in those areas disappear. I also think that most people just need to have a better understanding about having a little bit of stomach fat and being completely fine with that. I'm, I'm hoping that we're moving in a direction now where people are realizing that you know, you don't have to have a six pack to be healthy or to be, to look good or be sexy or any of that kind of stuff. Um, I, anyway, we'll get to that. And I'm sure in another myth, cause I think there's one that talks specifically about that. All right. Number two is the more you sweat, the more fat you're going to lose. My favorite sort of example that I think people get tied up on is, you know, seeing these wrestlers or these MMA fighters put on like that trash bag and then go on the bike and just like do an hour of cardio. And then at the end, they've just got this huge bag of water that's just hanging out and they got to go dump it. Disgusting. Um, but, you know, there's this idea like, oh, you know, they're losing weight in that way or you're burning more body fat when you sweat. That's not true. Um, so any of the weight that you see those like MMA people do or those boxers do, that's all water weight. And that comes back fairly quickly. I think within 24 hours, you can gain that water back. They just do that to make weight before a fight. So if you're a fighter and you're in the 155 class, let's say, I don't even know if that's an actual class, but, um, and you, you know, lose enough water weight, let's say you lose four pounds of water weight, then, you know, when you weigh in, you can go back and, and get that water weight back on you. It's just a tactic for quick weigh-ins where weight actually matters for you to qualify for something or, or something like that. The more you sweat has nothing to do with body fat loss. You might be thinking, well, it's raising my metabolism, burning more calories. Um, I get the logic behind that. But again, one of the things you have to know about 
um, burning calories is that first and foremost, you're really not burning as many calories as you think. I know that you have a trusty treadmill at the gym or maybe at your house, and it tells you you burn 500 calories for your 45 minute run. Uh, but I hate to break it to you. Those things are not very accurate because they're based on a formula that's based on a very generic and, and general sort of calorie burn. And it's not a very accurate number. Number two, the amount of calories you burn through exercise isn't really that impactful. And here's why. Your body is actually going to adapt to how many calories you burn for any given exercise if you do it over the course of time. So for example, let's say the 1st of January you went for a run. And let's say the most accurate tool that we have told you that you burned 500 calories on that run. That's great. Awesome. Cool stuff. 30 days from now, your body might only burn 350 calories doing the exact same work, same intensity, same duration, all that stuff. And you might be thinking, okay, well, that makes sense. But as I get more fit, I will be able to do more. Point taken. But here's another thing you have to consider. How much are you going to actually be able to commit to exercise and, and amping up the intensity? There's only so much you can do before you're going to hit a plateau, whether it's from time or intensity or you just burn out. So what's more important to understand, I know I'm going like on a very far tangent with this, but this is a topic that keeps coming up. People keep trying to exercise their way to fat loss. And I see it as a big problem. Not that exercise shouldn't be something you utilize during a fat loss journey, but it's something that too many people take, and I'm guilty of this. I'm certainly not saying I'm, I'm like on a pedestal or something, but so many people try to exercise their way out of you know, having body fat. And it just doesn't work that way. Having a moderate, uh, you know, to your ability level type of exercise routine is all you need. The most important thing for exercise is just consistency. Like if you're able to do, you know, third, you know, three gym workouts a week, and, and maybe you, as you get more advanced, you can throw in two cardio sessions. So you're working out five days a week. If you can do that and just maintain that over a long period of time, that'll be way more impactful than trying to spend, you know, 45 minutes to an hour doing a very intense, you know, hit session or very intense, you know, running session and trying to burn calories uh, and not just try to eat better. So, you know, 30% is, is probably about exercise. 70% is nutrition. All right. I'll go ahead and keep that there. All right. Number three, no pain, no muscle gain. I don't want this to be confused with discomfort. So pain and discomfort are very different. Um, if you're uncomfortable during your workout, that's normal. You should be uncomfortable. You're putting yourself in a stressful situation, controlled, you know, but you're putting yourself in a stressful situation and you're stressing your body in a very controlled and uh, hopefully well-planned out way. The problem that I have with this kind of alludes to the last one, which is if you are going to the point where you're like burning out or you're getting exhausted or you're, you know, potentially getting hurt, then we have a problem. And the no pain, no gain thing, I think it gets taken out of context. I think the original use of it probably made a lot of sense, but pain's probably the wrong word. It, their only reason they're really using pain is because it rhymes with gain and it's a cliche and it's all that stuff. But really, if you're not uncomfortable, you're not going to grow. Like that's kind of what I like to think about. And so the, in the self-development space, you hear that a lot. Like if you're comfortable for too long, you're, you're not growing. You're not getting to that next level in your life, whether it's an internal thing that you want to improve or it's in your career or whatever it might be. So while no pain, no gain is a cool slogan, if it's taken out of context, which for a lot of people it is because they sort of glorify it in the Nike ads or in any sort of, you know, sporting ads, um, I think too many people can get lost in the the ecstasy of that, so to speak, and not realize that if you're doing some crazy workout and you're hurting yourself, that you're on the right track. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, if you are doing a workout that's so intense that you potentially hurt yourself or you do something to where it keeps you out of the gym, it's the worst thing you could possibly do. I rather most people leave the gym only working about 80% to their capacity and then being able to do a workout two to three days later, especially if it's strength training, because that's a good little routine to keep. So I always err on the side of a little bit more caution than I do trying to like push a workout to the very extreme. Back when I was competing for obstacle races and things like that, yeah, I would push it because I had to in order to compete at that level. But that's a very unique and sort of um, annual type of thing. It wasn't something I was doing very often. And for most people listening to this podcast, that's not something that you're probably doing. And if you are, I can provide advice on the side if you need it. But for the general person, the average person listening to this, that's not a good mantra to go by. All right. Number four is doing ab exercises is what gives you a six pack. 
So I don't know if you know this, but you already have a six pack. You're born with one. You have six different ab muscles that all show when your body fat is low enough. So you actually don't need to do any ab exercises in order to get a six pack. What you actually have to do is control what you put in your mouth. That's basically it. Now, is, am I saying that you shouldn't do core exercises? Absolutely not. But so many people are going to overdo the core exercises. I even had clients that would be like, can we dedicate the last 10 minutes to core exercises? And I'm like, sure, but why? And nine times out of 10, they would say, oh, I'm trying to lose fat in this area or I'm trying to get more toned here. And I had to you know, try to explain to them. And there are plenty of people that just didn't want to listen to me. Like they just wanted to do it because they were sort of swimming in their own bias and, you know, whatever. At the end of the day, 10 minutes of that stuff isn't going to be the end of the world if they give me, you know, 50 minutes of what I know is going to help them. But for you, the person who wants to do this on their own and can take control of your own health, I'm telling you, if you're spending more than five to 10 minutes doing any sort of like crazy core exercises where you're, you know, lifting your legs and doing all this different stuff, I think for most people that isn't needed. If you have to do any core exercises, you should do the ones that help you stabilize your body in functional movements. So things like planks, as boring as they look, um, mountain climbers, those look a little bit more exciting. Um, side planks, uh, pal-off presses, I'm probably saying stuff that you've never heard of before. And if you have heard of it, kudo points. Um, but what you really want to train your core to do is anti-flexion. So trying to keep it stable in position when you're doing other things. Because when you're doing squats, when you're doing overhead press, when you're doing bench press, every time you do any sort of movement, whether you're pushing or pulling, your core has to stabilize and your core has to brace in order to make that movement efficient. One of the most important things I ever learned in any of the seminars and any of the research and any of the, um, you know, coaching that I ever got for myself to improve myself as a coach was always things that helped you brace and control your core more. Because when you have your control, when you have your core under control and you have it braced and locked in, you're able to do things with push-ups, with overhead pressing, with any sort of movement so much more efficiently. I've fixed push-up. There was a woman that I had, uh, that I was training and she had the most difficult time doing push-ups. And she actually had a relatively strong upper body. Like she could bench press a pretty good amount of weight. But her problem was is that she wasn't bracing her core. So one of the heaviest parts of her body that could actually help her stabilize during her movement um, wasn't being fired, wasn't being activated. So all I had to do was strengthen her core, teach her how to brace her core, and then all the rest of her body could actually function the way that it, it was meant to function. So anyway, again, another little tangent, but you know, when you're thinking about it, ab exercises are great sort of auxiliary exercises, things that you can throw in at the end of your workout, but you shouldn't be prioritizing an entire workout around doing core exercises. I promise you no amount of sit-ups, no amount of crunches is going to give you a six pack. All right, number five, this is the one that I got duped by the hardest. And I was actually a big proponent of thinking that this was a myth that was true. And there was a lot of research that I went into and it just turned out that what was actually happening was what anything happens when you lose body fat. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But there's nothing special about skipping breakfast or only eating past a certain amount of time or condensing your food window between you know noon and 8 p.m. There's nothing special about that. All that is doing for you is helping reduce the amount of calories that you're going to consume. You could do the same thing if you ate 10 meals a day. You could do the same thing if you only ate breakfast. You could do the same thing if you only ate lunch. All you're doing is restricting the amount of calories you're consuming. And I would even argue that for a lot of people who don't know the research, who don't have any experience with intermittent fasting, it can actually put you in such a low amount of calories that trying to build back up your calorie tolerance, as I call it, which is essentially a calorie maintenance, the amount of calories you can eat without gaining or losing weight. And you want to try to get that number as high as you possibly can. Like if you could eat 2,500 calories a day and not gain a pound, that would be awesome, right? Because that means that you could probably eat a medium-sized pizza every single day and only have one other meal a day and you would be fine. Sounds great on paper, but it'd probably be disgusting after a while. My point is, is that there's nothing magic about intermittent fasting. One of the reasons why I've been able to do intermittent fasting for so long, and I still do it to this day, is because it sort of falls in a natural pattern for me. I typically am not hungry in the morning. I typically will work out in the morning. So I, I don't know about you, but after I work out, I'm not hungry. I, it usually takes two or three hours, maybe four hours before I start feeling hungry. So that's just my natural way of doing things. I'm not starving myself. I'm not purposely not eating, even though I'm like really, really hungry. I just know that 
my body works best when I don't really eat until 11, you know, 12 around lunchtime. And that's just been a very consistent pattern for me. I'm not fighting myself every single day. I'm not restricting myself in this crazy way that, um, you know, is detrimental to my long-term health. I will say this though, in the beginning with intermittent fasting, it was a little bit harder after the first two weeks, it got easier, but the first two weeks were, it was a bit of a change. My body wasn't used to that. And we could do a whole entire podcast on intermittent fasting, which I probably will do for those that are at least interested in trying it because I've been doing it for five years and it's just like I could talk about it all day long. But any sort of adjustment you make with your nutrition is going to have a period of, you know, adjustment where you're feeling, you know, a little, a uh, little off, a little different. One other thing I want to just throw out there, and I don't have any like research here in front of me to, to state this, but I've heard some very credible people, uh, Dr. Gabrielle Lyons, is it Lyons or Lyon? I'm not exactly sure, but, um, she recommends that women actually not do intermittent fasting because of the way their hormones work and things like that. So if you want to find out more about that and not wait on me to do that podcast, go check out her podcast as she talks about it pretty often. And if you're just a woman and you want to improve yourself, there's a lot of things I'm not going to be able to help you with. I would definitely go check out Gabrielle Lyons um, uh, stuff because she's just phenomenal. She knows way more about women's health than I do. So definitely go check her out. There goes my entire, my half of my entire fan base, but it's for a good reason. All right. Number six is cardio is more important than any other form of exercise for fat loss. Kind of already debunked this as in the first one, um, but cardio could not even exist in your fat loss plan and you could lose plenty of fat. In fact, I almost coach that to a T. So when I coach people, I let them determine how much cardio they want to do. And nine times out of 10, they come to me and want to work with me because I'm not somebody forcing cardio down their throat. And that's because really the most important thing is your calorie balance, or I guess in, if you're trying to lose body fat, a calorie deficit. And it's actually smarter in my opinion, but I would say that the research would show this too, that it's probably better for you to lift weights and eat in a calorie deficit for a longer period of time than try to lift, do cardio, and eat in a calorie deficit. And here's why. Your body naturally tries to replace the calories that you burn. Because when you burn an excess amount of calories, you got to remember, you burn a certain amount of calories every single day just being alive. What I mean is it's not a lot of calories, meaning you couldn't just do that and lose body fat. It probably wouldn't be a good idea. But what I am saying is, is that after a certain amount of time burning calories through exercise, your body's like very aggressively trying to bring calories back in because it doesn't want a huge distance between how much you eat and how much you burn. So what it naturally will do almost subconsciously, I've noticed this with myself, is that if you try to restrict calories too much for too long without any sort of feed, as it's called, then your body will turn on hormones that will almost make you eat in an abundance. And I don't mean like overeat, but like you will be driven by hormones, which are very powerful to eat more calories. I would say for people that don't properly uh, schedule and plan out their, their fat loss plan, this happens nine times out of 10. That happens to most people who can't seem to just get the fat off. And I'm not talking about the last 10 pounds. I'm talking about the beginning of your fat loss journey. So starving yourself is never going to work, at least not for the long haul. You might have five days where you have you know, six pack abs. But after that, unless you took photos, it's pretty much gone. So just remember that cardio doesn't need to be a part of a fast lo fat loss plan. It's certainly not the most important thing. But if you do enjoy doing cardio, that's great. But most of us don't. So those, this tip is for everyone who doesn't enjoy cardio. All right, this is probably my favorite. Even though number five is the one that hits the closest to home, number seven is actually my favorite. And that is weight loss and fat loss are the same thing. So this is kind of a trick question because when you lose fat, you are losing weight. But when you're losing weight, you're not always losing fat. Well, how could that be? There's three to four major ways that you can lose weight. Uh, poop, right? We all know that one. Water weight, fat weight, and muscle. So out of the four of those, which one do you think you want to lose the least? And if you say poop, get out of here. That's not the point. The one you want to lose the least is muscle. When you've worked so hard in the gym to build muscle, the last thing you want to do is waste it by under eating and you know, burning your muscle. Now, that being said, burning muscle and getting rid of muscle to a certain extent isn't really something to be that worried about if you're just you know, going to the gym pretty consistently. But if you, you know, take two years off like I did, you're going to lose some muscle mass. And I definitely did. I didn't lose it all, but I, I lost, you know, some of the, the stuff that was a little bit harder to work on. Anyway, 
Um, so you actually want to lose fat. Now, losing fat can be challenging because if you're using a traditional scale, um, and I know scales are getting to the point now where they can measure body fat, be it you know not that accurate, but we ha- we're living in that world now. So when you weigh yourself and you go up two pounds and you might be thinking, oh my God, I'm eating less, I'm exercising more, I'm drinking plenty of water. Why did I go up two pounds? And this is the psychological problem that I have with scales is that scales give you one large number for four different ways that you could have gained or lost you know, weight. So you could have gained two pounds of muscle in that time period. You could have gained two pounds of water. You could have had a really salty dinner and full of carbs. So let's say you had a pizza for dinner or had pizza for dinner. You could very easily go up three to four pounds the next morning because you're holding onto water because of the salt. You just ate a lot of food, so it's sitting in your stomach. That's one way that you could gain weight. It's not always going to be fat. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that it takes 3,500 calories in order to make a pound of fat. So unless you're doing that on a very consistent basis, and trust me, there are people out there that do do that, unless you're doing that consistently, the weight change that you have from day to day or even three days to four days isn't going to be all fat. There might be a very small percentage of that. It might be a quarter of a pound or half a pound. And if that's the case, then yeah, maybe you want to look at your nutrition and and troubleshoot your your calorie deficit a little bit more. Uh, That's going to be another episode in the future. But trust me, when you look at the scale day to day, you're not gaining and losing one pound of fat, one pure pound of fat. You're not gaining or losing one pound of pure muscle. Nine times out of 10, if you lose or gain weight in a 24-hour period, it's water or it's poop, all right? So don't freak out. It's it's not something to be overly concerned about. Um, One of the most frustrating things about being a coach was explaining that in my clients still having these psychological sort of withdrawals and depressions due to the scale change to the point where for most of them, I just took the scale away. I said, give it to your spouse, give it to somebody, have them hide it somewhere or lock it up and just don't use it because it wasn't benefiting them. But if you can have a healthy mindset about using the scale, then what you actually want to do is look at the week over week over week change right? Because if you look at an actual person's fat loss journey over the course of three months, this, the numbers look like this. They go up and down, up and down, up and down. Sometimes they go down twice in a row. Sometimes they go up twice in a row. But if you looked at it over a three-month period and you drew a line from the first day they started to the last day they started, it would hopefully go down. So if you have, a, if you have measurements like this and it's going down, you're doing everything right. If it stays like a flat line, then you might want to consider the fact that you're not in a calorie deficit or some, you, maybe you need to add a little bit more exercise or one more day of strength training. But it's usually the calorie deficit that you need to play with. If, you're, if your measurement starts here and ends up here, you're on the wrong side of the equation, my friend. I mean, you're definitely overeating or you, your plan is out of whack. So losing fat and losing weight is not the same thing. And I'm probably going to do an entire episode on how to properly use a scale and how to properly measure your fat loss journey. Uh, Because I think so many people, even to this day, struggle with the scale, struggle with understanding what they should actually do when it comes to their measurements and how often to do them and all of this different stuff. So, all right, on from number seven to number eight, eating sugar makes you fat. Ha, I wish it was that easy because if it was, we wouldn't have to keep talking about this. But the truth of the matter is, is that sugar doesn't make you any fatter than eating fat. It's it, 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 like if you eat peanut butter versus eating sugar, it's it's no different if calories are the same. The reason why so many people think that sugar makes you fat is because some of the fattest people in the world eat a lot of sugar. But if you were to just do the exact same thing and eat some sugar and keep your calories controlled, you'd be fine. There are plenty of people that eat a moderate amount of sugar, whether it's in foods or it's part of a, you know, a nightly ritual they have where they're eating a little piece of candy, they got a sweet tooth or, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. If you're mindful of how much you're eating, sugar doesn't make you fat. The problem with sugar is that it's highly palatable. It's delicious. I mean, it's it's one of the most amazing foods that we could ever have, but a lot of people can use it to mask emotional pain, stress, uh, you know, mental health issues. They use food to mask those things, which means they probably are overeating those things to feel good. Um, there's a lot of things that go into sugar. Sugar is a very easy type of calorie to overeat. So it's 
it's, it's just natural that it, that is going to happen um, for the people that, you know, are overeating those types of foods. So no, naturally speaking, if you just consume sugar in a very moderate way, it's not going to make you fat. The problem is, is that when you eat it to a point where your calories are going over how much you burn, it all comes down to how much, how many calories your body burns versus how many you consume. So just keep that in mind when we're thinking about uh, sugar, you know, making you fat. All right, moving on to number nine. Low-carb diets help your body lose body fat faster. Not true. There are plenty of people that do uh, you know, carb-balanced diets or even carb-rich diets who can lose body fat you know, just as easily as somebody who doesn't. Um, the, the biggest myth, I think, in the 21st century has been that carbs make you fat. What the motto should really be, just like we talked about sugar in the last one, is that carbs are very easy to eat a lot of. And some of the most delicious processed foods are made of carbohydrates. So if you were to give me a bag of potato chips or a bag of tortilla chips, just so you know, tortilla chips is my vice. Like that and coffee are like my two things that I just, those are my things. Those are my foods or drinks or whatever. If you were to give me a bag of potato chips and then you were to give me a steak, after eating the steak, I wouldn't want another steak. But after the bag of potato chips, I would probably still be hungry. And there have been plenty of times where I've eaten like an entire sleeve of Ritz crackers and been like, didn't even make a dent. I'm still hungry. I'm still going to go eat something else. So when you think about it like that, if I was to give you 500 calories of a steak, which would be a crap load of steak, and 500 calories of you know tortilla chips or a cracker or whatever, your level of hunger would be different after consuming those. And most people eat until they're full. They don't eat until they go, oh, I've hit 500 calories because our bodies don't work like that. Our bodies work based on very simple things like what is our food made out of? Protein is more filling. Fat tends to be more filling. Carbohydrates, depending on what they are, typically not that filling. Um, If you eat a potato without butter, you'll probably be sick of it within the first three bites. So nature's foods have these built-in calorie controls where we're not going to, we're likely not to overeat them until we process them in some sort of way, which is why processed food is so easy to overeat. So these low carb diets you see everybody on is what it's really doing is it's helping people control the types of foods that they're going to naturally overeat. So that's what's working there. That's the mechanism that's working. They're reducing their total calories. They're burning more calories per day or per week than they are consuming. So then their body is tapping into their stored resources, which is body fat, and that's how they're losing body fat. So the person who's doing carnivore, the person who's doing keto, or the person who's doing, uh, you know, uh, like a plant-based diet with lots of complex carbohydrates, beans, rice, and things like that, if they're eating in a calorie deficit, they're all going to lose fat. It doesn't matter so much what you eat in terms of, uh, you know, it being a a carb versus a fat versus a, a protein. What's most important is are you eating foods that are helping keep you full, that are helping uh, keep you from you know, snacking between meals, uh, that are keeping your calorie limit uh, you know, in check? If you're doing those things, it doesn't matter if you're keto, you know, vegetarian, carnivore, whatever. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It all comes down to calories. All right, we made it to number 10. Number 10 is lifting heavy weights makes you big and bulky. Oh man, this is a fun one, especially with my female clients. Lifting heavy weights does not make you big and bulky. If you do it over a long period of time and you build muscle, yeah, you can build a lot of muscle. But if we're talking specifically about the female anatomy, you have to do a lot in order to get big and bulky. And everyone has a different interpretation of what that really means. And so I'm not going to be able to speak to everyone's definition of what it looks like to be big and bulky. But what I used to do with my female clients is I'd say, Tell me the sort of body type that you want to try to emulate, that you would want to try to work towards. And I'm not a big proponent of of trying to look like somebody else, but there are certain things like leanness and muscle tone that you can pull from you know somebody else. And so I'd have them bring in a photo, and I would just be very realistic with them. A lot of times I'd say, what is too bulky or what is too big, and what is an ideal look for you, just to kind of get a reference. And you know, nine times out of ten, what would make me laugh when I would see the photos, and I wasn't trying to be rude. I was just it's just funny to me being in this industry is that the types of bodies that my female clients wanted were the, were the types of people and types of women that lifted weights pretty frequently. Like a lot of the programs that I would put my female clients on are the same ones or, you know, similar versions of the ones that their ideal body type person uh, was doing. And the reason I knew that is because 
a lot of them, I'd go look and, and see what their workout programs are. And they were lifting and they were doing some cardio, but most importantly, they were controlling their nutrition. And, and so what I used to tell them was, is like, listen, lifting weights is not going to make you big and bulky. You're not going to be walking around like those dudes with invisible lat syndrome. And if you don't know what that is, just type it in Google. It's, it's a good laugh. But yeah, you're not going to look like that doing these weighted programs. I would even um, do programs by guys like Brett Contreras, who is the glute guy, and he focuses specifically on the types of muscles that most women want to improve, which is their butt, their thighs, the back of their legs, uh, you know, their stomach area, things like that. So I would do those programs with him. I was like, I, it doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> like this guy designs programs specifically for, you know, female bodies that want to, you know, get bigger in these areas. Um, I'm telling you that the women that you want to emulate are doing programs just like this one. Uh, it doesn't get much better than this. Like we, this, and so sometimes that would help them, you know, psychologically with the idea that like lifting weights is good for me. It always helps with their you know, someone they look up to lifts weights because they're like, oh, I would love to look like her, but I'm afraid of lifting weights. Oh, she lifts weights. Okay, cool. Well, then maybe I'll do it too. So if you're a woman who's out there who doesn't touch weights because you're afraid of getting bulky or you're afraid of lifting heavy because you're going to get, you know, these big bulky muscles, I can promise you that not only are your sex hormones not necessarily lined up to make that happen, um, but there's a good chance that the big and bulky look that you're, you're thinking that you're going to get is by an enhanced woman who's doing, you you know, drugs and uh, doing lots of lifting and probably lifts 24 seven all day long. Like it's a whole different lifestyle. Um, and you don't have to do that type of thing in order to, to look good and lean. All right. Number 11, working out fasted burns more body fat than working out after a meal. Definitely not true. Uh, and then this is another one like intermittent fasting that I used to believe. Now I just full disclaimer, I work out fasted because I'm working out at like 4 35 a.m. I'm not going to eat before then. I also don't necessarily like working out right after I eat. I usually need about one to two hours before it gets digested and assimilated and I can actually feel good and not like I'm going to puke. Um, but there's no advantage over working out fasted versus working out after a meal. Um, there's It's even argued that working out having already eaten that day is probably going to be better for being able to do things like weightlifting because you actually have calories that are on, that are easily accessible and on board for you to use. That being said, that might also not be true. I've read research that shows that your glycogen stores, which is the main source of energy that you use when you're lifting weights or doing any sort of like interval type training where you do hard work for a certain period of time and then you almost match it equally with rest. And um, that goes to show that you have plenty of, of that type of energy in your body, even is, you know, early in the morning. Like, let's say you just wake up and you, you know, go for a run or you go do a workout, you'll have energy stored in your muscle cells for that type of exercise. You don't need to eat in order to do that. So all that being said, you don't have to eat before a workout and you can also not eat and work out. Just from personal experience is obviously anecdotal, but I've noticed that my workouts when I lift weights fasted tend to lose steam around the 30 minute mark, which is perfect for me because that's all the time I have at this moment. But back when I had more time, when I would hit that 30 minute mark, my lifts after that were pretty bad, like to the point where I probably should have just stopped because I could have hurt myself not being more efficient. So now what I do, if it makes sense for my schedule is like if my daughter goes down for a nap, when I, when I work out on the weekends, I will typically have eaten lunch already. So I have, you know, calories on board to fuel that workout. And I have noticed that I'm able to go 45 minutes to an hour and which is I usually don't go past an hour, but I usually go that long and I feel pretty good, or I should say better than I do when I'm fasted. So Again, all of this research is only relevant if you actually use it, but just know that you can work out having eaten and you can work out having not eaten. It's not going to make a big difference. One more thing I'll say on that, I never do any sort of high intensity cardio, whether it's, you know, interval training or even just like go do a run outside if I had just eaten. I find that that makes me feel sicker than having like doing squats or lifting weights, things like that. All right, number 12 is you must drink or eat protein right after a workout to maximize your protein synthesis. I believe this one probably the longest out of all of these. And that's mostly because the research wasn't 100% clear on this. But it when you look at studies on when you should consume protein, it's actually better to space out your protein throughout the day than to worry about consuming it at any point specific time. So I still remember when I first started working out, my dad used to make me a protein shake because he was trying to get me in the habit of all this stuff. And he would say, you got to finish it within like 10 minutes. And I was like, 
got like getting brain freeze, drinking a protein smoothie and doing it in the sake of making sure all that protein got absorbed by my muscles. But it turns out that science has shown that you there's no anabolic window. There's no optimal time to consume protein. Uh, what's a better strategy is actually consuming protein uh in sort of an interval throughout the day. So, you know, you have a, you know, breakfast, you have protein with breakfast, and then maybe, you know, you have lunch, you have protein with lunch, and then maybe there's a snack in the afternoon, try to add some protein to that. So eating protein more frequently throughout the day is, is probably a better strategy. That being said, if you're trying to get, you know, a good amount of protein, like one gram per pound of body weight, you almost have to consume protein after your workout just to get enough you know, intervals in before the day is over, but it's not something that has to be, you know, done. It's just, it's just recommended because it's easier and more convenient than trying to eat a hundred grams of protein for dinner, which don't, I don't recommend that at all. All right. Number 13, you should stretch before you lift weights. So funny enough, research actually shows that stretching for too long before you lift weights can actually quote unquote, turn off the muscle. You can't really turn off a muscle, but it sort of uh, makes it less uh, primed for your lifting session. So what you do should do instead is something called dynamic stretching, which is a combination of moving and stretching. So we used to do this routine back when I would do group uh, training classes that was exactly that. You would stretch for maybe three to five seconds, and then you do some type of movement to get the blood flowing. So it's still important to do some sort of uh, you know, mobility work and, and being able to prime your body for your lifting session, but you don't need to stretch your legs for you know one minute each and do that thing where you bring your arm overhead and stretch for one minute there. If you're going to stretch before a workout, make the, the stretching short intervals. So like three second holds followed by some sort of movement that gets the blood flowing. Three second hold by some sort of movement that gets the blood flowing. It's really as simple as that. So you could either not stretch or you could do kind of a minimal interval style stretch. But yeah, it, you don't have to stretch before a lifting session. All right, we're already at number 14. This one is you should stop lifting weights if you're 60 or older. Yeah, right. That's a bad idea. If there's any time in your life that you should be lifting weights, it's in your later years. Like, that's why I think I get on men so much about this. Not so much men. I mean, everyone. But like when I talk to guys and they're like, oh, you know, you know, life got in the way, all this stuff. I'm like, dude, you have no advantages for you. Like nature does not care about you anymore. You're going to start losing muscle. Your testosterone is going to drop. Like you don't have any room to not lift weights. If there's one thing I could recommend to every guy to try to keep that vitality, it's to lift weights. It's like the best thing for your brain. It's the best thing for your bones. It's the best thing for your body and your muscles. I mean, it's just, it has so many benefits. I, I heard a quote the other day that said, that if lifting weights um, could be put in a syringe or put in a pill, it would be banned by every single sporting um, organization in the world because it's just, it's basically one of the most powerful, th powerful things you can do for your hormones, for your body, for your longevity, for your health. I mean, it's just, it's so beneficial. So saying that anyone should stop lifting weights short of it being because, you know, it's going to make their life even worse, which is a rare case, um, is a terrible idea. I think that's just, that doesn't make any sense. You should probably be careful, right? Like you shouldn't, you know, as you get older, you're not going to be as mobile, especially if you're one of the millions of people, including myself, who sit at a desk all day. You probably shouldn't go out and do 500 pound deadlifts if you've only ever deadlifted 200 pounds. Um, but to not lift weights at all is, is stupid. It should actually be the other way around. Like if you're getting older and you don't lift weights, you should definitely start doing it in any way in, that you possibly can. All right, number 15, you have to work out for at least an hour for that workout to be effective. Wrong. A workout for an hour is not a bad benchmark, but it's not a requirement. You could do a very effective workout in 15 minutes, in 30 minutes, in 45 minutes. Um, I wouldn't recommend working out for an hour and a half unless you're like a bodybuilder and you've got a bunch of time on your hands, something like that. But um, if you're working out intensely enough, depending on the type of workout you're doing, because it does depend on you know the type of workout, like you don't want to do an hour of HIIT training. You don't even want to do like 30 minutes of HIIT training. I would say probably 15 to 20 minutes of actual HIIT training, the way it's meant to be done, is more than enough. Uh, for that type of, uh, you know, workout. But if you're doing like a traditional weightlifting session, I usually recommend no more than 45 minutes. Um, I've even created programs that basically end directly at 45 minutes if you follow it, you know, the way it should be followed. And that's because just the research shows that, you know, when you, when you are working out intensely, uh, that's about as much 
time as you need, you know, following a plan that's detailed and organized and you're not on your phone for, you know, 10 minutes after your first set, that 45 minutes at an intense weightlifting pace is about all you want to really prioritize and all your body can really handle before things start, you know, going awry. Meaning like you're going to be so fatigued that when you're lifting, you could possibly hurt yourself and put yourself in a position where now your next workout is a question mark. And I've actually done that before. I've worked out in a fasted, fatigued, didn't sleep very good state, um, pretty much a perfect storm. And it doesn't require that, but it's just an example from my own life. And I actually hurt myself on a lift because I just didn't have the resources on board to, to properly lift. So I can tell you first and foremost that there have been workouts where I should have stopped at 45 minutes and I went to an hour and I noticed very easily that the risk of getting hurt went way up. Now, thankfully, you know, I'm not the smartest person in the world, so I did continue working out and I didn't get hurt, but the risk goes way up. Like it's it's not even worth the extra reps that you're going to get. You're better off stopping at 45 minutes, recovering properly the next one to two days, and then lifting again. Uh, when it comes to, I know it's not the cool thing and I know it's nothing to brag about, but it's better to be conservative with your weightlifting and your exercise sessions because the goal is always uh, how consistent and how much momentum can you build. So if we're talking about like the perfect plan, having a consistent workout plan is way better than having a very intense workout plan. So I've had clients where I tell them like, I just want you to walk five days a week. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but I just want you to walk five days a week and you need to walk for at least 15, 20 minutes around your neighborhood at a park, whatever. I don't care, but you need to do those things. And then with your nutrition, what I want you to do is aim to eat this many calories a day. It doesn't have to be perfectly you know, laser focused, but this, this calorie range. And I've gotten great results with clients just doing those two things. And there's a lot of reasons why, and there's a lot of background that we'll cover in a different episode. But my point is, is that you don't want to overdo exercise. You want to do the right amount. You want to do what's prescribed. Doing more, which is very easy to do, especially if you're living in that like endorphin high of exercise, it's very easy to want to do more. But the ramifications and the, the, the things that can happen if you do do that do not outweigh the benefits. I can tell you from personal experience and just general research, it's not worth it. So anyway, uh, you don't have to work out for an hour. In fact, if you have a really good hit workout, you can be done in 15 minutes. Trust me. And I've written and done those programs. And yeah, you don't want to work out for longer doing that type of workout. All right, so that is the 15 myths that should be dead but aren't dead. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thanks a ton for listening or watching no matter where you are. If you want to connect and you want to be a part of the Shane Hubbard Fit community, we hang out on social media. We hang out through this podcast. The best place to reach out to me is at Shane Hubbard Fit on Instagram. I'm also on YouTube, which is pretty much a mirror of this podcast and some other content that I do, like my uh, workout video journals, which are tend to be a little bit more entertaining than this podcast just because I'm all over the place in that one. So definitely go check that out. But anyway, I hope you have a great rest of your day and I will see you in the next episode.